Benvenuti al GCN show in Alta Padilla in the Dolomites. Welcome to the GCN show, brought to you by Wiggle. This week, ASO announces a gridding system for stage 17 of the Tour de France, which is a 65 kilometer mountainous route. And so we are discussing if this is a glimpse into the future of pro racing. We certainly are. Zip has some new wheels. They do. There might be a new way to detect doping. Look and SRM have a new power meter. And there's the welcome return of the 10 year celebrity cycling link. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that bears, along with a certain enjoyment for in the woods, also quite like to devour some healthy snacks. Uh, a family of bears in Lake Tahoe broke into Quick Step Floors accommodation there and nicked most of what was in their fridge. It's a bit greedy. I would have thought they just needed the bear necessities. But um, first of the day. We also learned in cycling this week that not only will we never be as good at cycling as Peter Sagan is, we're never going to be as strong as he is either. No. Uh, we also learned this week in cycling that for the first time in its history, the Tour de France is going to introduce a gridding system to one of its mass start stages. Yeah, it certainly is. So this story was initially picked up by Het Newsblad and then the ever-informed inner ring on Twitter was there to expand our knowledge of what's going on and explain the exact rules. So stage 17 is 65 kilometres long, but features three mountain passes and starts right at the foot of the Col de Perisord. And the yellow jersey will be given permission to start right at the very front. Uh, there will then be offset rows with the rest of the rides just behind him uh, in the top 20 of GC. And subsequently, very quickly after that, four separate groups, uh, the composition of which will also be governed by an individual rider's placing in the overall GC. Now we are going to discuss exactly how this is going to affect this year's race in our racing news section later in this show. But it did get us thinking, uh, is this the future of pro cycling, not necessarily the gridding, but the shorter distances. The shorter distances, yeah. Well, there's absolutely no doubt that the general trend in Grand Tours has been for sure to stage. And it's a really interesting prospect. And I think that really was started by the organizers of the Vuelta Espana. Uh, they put plenty of short explosive stages in, the result of which was explosive racing, wasn't it, right from the very start? And I think it's been a great thing uh, for spectators on the roadside and also back at home especially. Definitely, and then if you think back to, there was a fantastic stage of the 2011 Tour de France, just 109 kilometers long, yeah. that included three mountain passes and finished on Alpe d'Huez. Yeah, on that day, Contador attacked early on, and while it wasn't enough for him to take the overall victory, it did tempt race leader at the time, Thomas Bockler, into chasing and subsequently blowing up, which turned the overall on its head. That was just a fantastic day of racing. It was. There's no denying that that was a very exciting stage to watch on TV. And there were some pretty good current examples of short explosive stages too. Uh, for example, the Criterium de Dauphiné, which started on Sunday, uh, has three back-to-back -back mountain days on Friday, Saturday and Sunday coming. And all of them are less than 135 kilometres in length. And we've just had two rounds of the Hammer Series too. Uh, that is, as you know, a three-day format uh, with a chase on the last day, a sprint the day before that, and starting with a climb. All those stages are less than two hours long and it means we get action right from the very start. But on the other hand, we've got the monuments, the five biggest and most historic one day races in our sport. They are particularly long, but their length hasn't actually changed that much in recent years and they still never fail to produce really exciting racing. That is true. So are shorter races the way forward? Maybe not for the monuments, you might be right there lastly, but I do think that for stage racing, they probably are. I mean, this is 2018, attention spans worldwide are at an all-time low, and yet the desire for constant action and excitement are therefore at an all-time high. And so I think that if cycling really wants to grow its audience base, shorter stages in Grand Tours are the way forward, and I think they will achieve that. I mean, who isn't looking forward to stage 17 of the Tour this year? I said, I can't wait. I Dan, I think you might upset a few of the traditional I've got no, I've got no doubt that I will be upsetting a few people. Sorry. One thing that we can do is look at other sports and see what they've done, with the sport of cricket being a great example. Yeah, don't turn off. Yeah, yeah. If you don't know anything about cricket, don't worry, we'll be brief because we do know that attention spans are getting shorter. Anyway, cricket used to be in the form of test matches, which are analogous to stage races in cycling. So they take place over a number of days. There are long periods of not very much happening. And 
different cycling rain stopped play. Yeah, and sometimes you didn't even get a winner at the end of the test matches because of rain, etc. And then along came 2020, which is a format whereby the winner is decided over the course of a maximum of two and a half hours. What did the traditionalists think about 2020? They hated it, of course they did. Where is it at now? Well, it is by far the most popular and lucrative side of cricket. And the examples don't stop there. So tennis recently experimented with a short form format over in Madrid, where the top 16 players in the world, men and women, uh, competed for the win over the course of just four hours. Or then there was the Golf Sixes recently too. Uh, that is a PGA European Tour tournament with two man national teams, uh, whereby they play for the win over the course of just six holes. Yeah, so we saw a lot of this information in an article by friend of the channel, Andrew Croker, mm. on sportcal.com. And in the article, Andrew argues that perhaps sport could be selling itself short. So you have examples like the NFL, which is increasingly struggling to hold viewers' attention for the full three hours that a game might take. Andrew also went on to say that perhaps permission is a factor, i.e. it's getting increasingly harder to get permission from your partner to spend more than two hours either doing a sport or watching a sport. That is very true, isn't it? Trying to get permission to get out on your bike for three hours can be awful. Uh, my uh, thing with that is that I just say it's part of my job, which is kind of true, but I'm very lucky from that perspective. Regardless, it does kind of feel that cycling has been stuck in the dark ages for a long time, with little or nothing changing in the sport, until now, that is. But what about the other side of the coin? Because I mean, I think cycling has a lot going for it, as it is. Take the Grand Tours, for example. These are incredible feats of human endurance. And if you were to run with shorter stages, you might cut the distance from, say, I think around three and a half thousand kilometers over three weeks, down to 2,000 kilometers or about 1,200 miles over three weeks. And you take it from an awesome feat of human endurance to something that I think realistically many, if not most, cyclists can achieve. Obviously, you won't be doing it quite as fast as the professional cyclists do, but it's just going to lose a bit of its aura, yeah. a bit of its shine. Well, we tend to agree. There's also the fact that we probably wouldn't have had quite such an exciting final week of the Giro recently without those longer stages. And then, as you mentioned, the monuments are kind of fine as they are, aren't they? I can't imagine Milan Remo, Roubaix, Flans, etc. anything other than six to seven hours. I love them exactly the way they are. Going back to the Grand Tours though, part of the, I guess, job, if you like, of a Grand Tour is to showcase the country that it's taking place in. So if you go for shorter stages, you can showcase less of the country by bike, less of the country on TV, and the kilometers that may have taken place on some of the longer transitional stages are just gonna be done in the team bus. Yeah, that's very true. It's not an easy subject, is it? It's quite complicated, in fact, deciding what the future of pro cycling might be. But as the saying goes, you don't know until you've tried. At least ASO are trying something this year with that 65 kilometer gridding experiment. We shall see how it goes in a couple of weeks time or a few weeks time. However, I think I know which stage this year most TV viewers will be tuning in for. And it's that one. Yeah, stage 17, definitely. Now, it's time for you to have your say we've got a poll on screen now where you can let us know if you think that this is the future of cycling and we'd also love for you to expand your thoughts down in the comments we do read all of your comments and we're going to reply to as many as we can yeah we will do indeed also let us know if you require permission from your partner to watch the gcn show it's now time for cycling shorts we shall start cycling shorts this week with a new cycling jersey just for the sheer fun of it. This is the jersey that Team Sky will be using for the upcoming Tour de France. And if you're wondering why there's a whale on the back, well the reason is that this is the start of their campaign whereby they are hoping to completely eliminate the use of single-use plastics within the team by the year 2020. And it prompted team rider Luke Rowe to come up with a pun that is possibly so bad that even we here at GCN would not resort to using yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is what he said. I thought I only represent my nation Team Wales at the Commonwealth Games. Uh, with a very nice use of emojis at the end. Yeah, emojis very much on point there. But it's certainly a very admirable aim from Team Sky and food for thought for all of us, really. Yeah, we could all do with cutting down our use of single-use plastics, couldn't we? Uh, also admirable is the fact that Paris-Roubaix organisers are going to name a sector of Pave after the late Michael Gerlach, who tragically lost his life after the race this year, uh, where he suffered a cardiac arrest. It's a three kilometre sector that runs from Beasley to Brias, and that is a very touching tribute. Certainly, I think it's a really, really nice touch from the organisers. Something, Dan, that I've been reading this week was an abstract for an article in Frontiers in Physiology. 
So scientific journal, obviously, probably one of Dan's favorites as well. And what this article is gonna set out is that there is perhaps a cheaper and possibly more efficient way of catching and tracking dopers than the current biological testing that yeah. takes place. Yeah, they're basically claiming that the way that drug testers have been going about their business for the last few decades has been completely wrong. Obviously, traditionally, and at the moment, the way they try to keep catch cheaters is by looking for certain chemical compounds in a rider system that are against the rules. Uh, however, what they say is that it would be much better to track performance through things such as power meters. Yeah, so what they argue is that by knowing a rider's maximal power under any given circumstance, you can actually really quite accurately track whether a performance is out of line or might have been influenced by something that maybe the rider shouldn't have been doing. Mm. This study, though, claims that you should be doing it by looking at a rider's performance data. Yeah, so what it says is that a rider's critical power curve, so that's the amount of power that you as a cyclist can put out for any given amount of time, is particularly sensitive to ergogenic aids and other interventions. Yeah, so they claim that they know how a rider's critical power curve might react uh, given if, well, if they've taken performance enhancing drugs. And if that is true, well you'd imagine it is a pretty good way to combat doping and possibly cheaper than a full drugs testing program too. Certainly, although presumably to actually get the accurate critical power curve, you've got to get all of the riders, so a peloton of World Tour riders, into a lab that is a, where the testing takes place under the same conditions. You can't just rely on me going to my local climb and saying, hey, here's my 20 minute functional threshold. And I think the other thing that may raise concerns amongst the riders is, as cyclists, we've all been there and basically forgotten to calibrate our power meters and thought, Wow, I'm on excellent form mm. today. I've always had concerns with the measuring of doping through performance uh, measured by current power meters. In the lab, fine. Uh, outside in the open road, most power meters are only accurate to plus or minus one and a half percent at the very best, but they can drift quite significantly if you don't keep them calibrated. And I'm not just talking about a t a compensation for temperature change on the ride, a lot of which a lot of power meters do that themselves now. I'm talking more about the changes of slope, etc., in the power. Now, of course, if things go extremely wrong and one of the strain gauges breaks and all of a sudden you're doing 2,000 watts instead of 500, that's very obvious. But sometimes things can happen where the power meter is off by four or five percent. Less obvious, and I wonder whether that would raise eyebrows amongst the researchers and testers um, for no reason. Personally, I would have claimed the four or five percent drift and said I was just having a great day. Like my best sprint power is over 1700 watts and I still claim it's it as not, a great day, not as a calibration error. It's not actually 1700 watts. That was an example of a power meter going wrong. Uh, right, moving on. I'm sure that you'll all be aware of what Everesting is by now. Uh, if you're not, it's basically where you head to a local climb and ride up and down that same local climb enough times that you've uh, climbed the equivalent of Everest which sounds hard enough to me. Uh, some people though want to make it a bit harder. One of those is Brechu, who's over on Strava, who didn't think once was hard enough, or even twice. Uh, he has Everested three times, the triple Everest. Yeah, that sounds absolutely horrific to be honest. But anyway, like Dan said, he did it on the same stretch of tarmac, so that's over 27,000 meters of vertical height gain, 567.81 kilometers, all completed on the same five and a half kilometer stretch of road. No. You are joking. The same five and a half kilometre section of the road. The same five and a half kilometre section that of the road. Is, well, you definitely wouldn't find me ever doing that. Well done to you. Anyway, that is quite Like this video achievement. if you think Dan should do that. 20,000 likes. No. Not happen. No. Anyway, moving on. Uh, we'd like to offer up huge congratulations from us here at GCN to Natalie Wilson. Uh, Natalie is living with EDS, which is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which amongst other things means that her joints can become very easily dislocated and it also severely affects her internal organs. Remarkable then that she has just become the first disabled female to circumnavigate Great Britain, uh, which she's done so on a tricycle. What an amazing achievement. Natalie start, began her journey at the end of February and arrived back at a start point in Brighton just last week. And she was doing it to raise awareness of EDS. So if you'd like to find out more about Natalie's record and also about EDS, head over to zebraonabike.co.uk. Yeah, well done to you, Natalie. She, she really had to deal with some horrific weather conditions in that time here in the UK too. Right, it's so the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time to bring back our uh, tenuous celebrity cycling link because apparently, in London at the weekend, Benedict Cumberbatch saved a delivery rider from being beaten up. Yeah, so 
Cumberbatch was in an Uber with his wife and saw a delivery cyclist with being attacked by four people. Apparently he got out and with the help of the Uber driver managed to fight off the attackers, perhaps saving the cyclist from serious injury. Wow. Imagine that. Imagine if you are that delivery cyclist lying on the ground. You look out and you see Sherlock Holmes coming to the rescue. I reckon it'd be scarier if you were the attacker. You'd be like, yeah, been busted. <laughs> Right, uh, to finish cycling shorts this week, uh, you might be wondering where Emma Pooley has been for the past few weeks, uh, apart from doing some other stellar videos at the Giro d'Italia. Uh, well, since then, she has been in Alta Badia in Italy, and here's an update from her. Ciao from Alta Badia in the Dolomites. It's my first time back in this area since, I think, 2012 when I raced the Giro di Trentino. Anyway, I've really enjoyed being out here. I don't understand why Si and Dad didn't want to come. Apparently they were busy with race coverage or something. Anyway, I feel extremely lucky because I've been staying at the wonderful Hotel Melodia del Bosque, which is where the guys stayed last year. It's been wonderful. I've also met loads of GCN fans. It's been pretty exciting. Got to make some really cool videos as well. I think my favourite was how to finally win the Strava segment you've been targeting. We've also done how to climb out of the saddle, an experiment with tyre pressure, some more core stability training videos, and what was the other one? Oh yeah, an experiment with clip-on aero bars where I finally got to use my GCN skin suit. While I'm out here, I thought I'd take a cheeky look at some of the climbs in the Maratona Dolomiti. So I've been up the Pordoi, the Campo Longo, the Gardena, the Fasarego, and they are beautiful. Also, to be honest, it's a pretty good thing that I got to do some cycling because the food here is just amazing. So I need to do quite a lot of riding to burn off all those calories. I can't wait to come back for the Maratona and um, watch out for that content on the channel. GCN Wiggle of Fortune time now. Uh, your chance to win one of four Wiggle voucher prizes between £25 and £150. Last week's contestant was Neil Orr. Uh, he won the bottom prize, unfortunately for Neil, £25 of Wiggle vouchers. But with that, he managed to get an Altura Airstream jersey, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, this week's contestant, lastly, Matt Detman from the USA. Okay, what you're after, Matt Detman, is prize one. Uh, which you can see here, 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 and here. And that is 150 pounds worth of wiggle vouchers, which you can spend on anything you want over on their online shop. So without further ado, you press the button last year, I'll give you the counting. Count me down. Uh, three, two, one, and we're off. Then. Let's see what your game is going to be. I think today. prize one, Adam. Optimistic for prize one. As you've noticed, I haven't mentioned the other prize on the board because it's round here. I'm it's not going to win it. One, it's going to be prize one. Is it going to be prize one? No, no, no. Oh! oh. Uh, that's the closest yet. Just like Neil or last week, you have won £25 worth of Wiggle vouchers. Uh, like Neil, if you could write in and let us know what you spend them on, that would be very much appreciated. And if you would like to be in with a chance of being next week's contestant, you know what you've got to do. You'll find a link in the description below. Follow that, enter your details, and we'll be selecting somebody next week. Yeah, good luck. Still haven't got a beer. Tech of the week now, and Zip has announced that they've updated their popular NSW line of wheels. So that's the 303s, the 404s, and the 808s. They've changed the internal rim width, which means that it's now 19 millimeters, so it will work better and be more aerodynamic with the wider tires that are so widely used now. 25 millimeters is apparently the optimum tire width for this new range. They've also done a big update. So carbon tubeless wheels are actually quite hard to come by. They are, they're, st yeah. they're still really quite uncommon. And these wheels are fully carbon and compatible with tubeless or tube tires, whichever you'd prefer. Yeah, good news for Zip fans. Uh, there's also a new power meter on the market. Yet another one. Uh, this one comes from the French manufacturer Look, uh, but it's been done in conjunction with kind of the original power meter production people, SRM. And to the best of our knowledge, it's the first time that SRM have deviated away from a crank-based power meter. So these pedals use two pairs of opposing strain gauges, which you can find at either end of the axle, uh, to give a claimed accuracy of plus or minus one and a half percent, which is up there with the best on the market, isn't it? Whether that's pedal based, crank based, or anywhere else based. Yeah, definitely. And look is also moving away from an ex accelerometer rather to measure cadence. So it uses mag sensors and magnets, which they say is a more accurate way of doing this. And despite all the tech, the stack height of the pedal actually isn't changed that much, which means that you're not going to ground your pedals in corners if you're doing crits. No, very true. Uh, they don't add much weight either, just 25 grams extra on each side, even with all those electronics. Uh, and you have to say that all the pedal based power meters out there, it probably does look the neatest, doesn't it? 
Comes in at 800 euros if you just opt for a single-sided pedal, which is the right side, uh, or 1400 euros if you go for the dual-sided version. And if you buy the right side of pedal, you of course get a left pedal too. It just, yeah, yeah, just you get the left pedal. Anything. Yeah, doesn't measure anything. Uh, exciting news for Zwift users now, in that much like they did three years ago with the Richmond World Championships, Zwift has partnered up with the Innsbruck World Championships this year. So you'll be able to ride the Innsbruck World Championship course on Zwift. You will be able to. But a word of warning, that course is... It's quite hard. It's brutal. It's not quite hard, it's brutal. 24K is long, but there's an eight kilometer climb each and every lap. Is I think it? I'll stick to, this sounds like one for Emma Pooley to me. I'm gonna to stick to the Richmond World's course, which was just undulating without being mountainous. Is there an eight kilometer descent? Well, you'd imagine so, yeah, it's on a lap. Racing news now, and for all of the results and happenings from the last week in bike racing, make sure you check out the GCN Cycling Race News Show. We're gonna start the racing news section with something slightly different, because we're gonna discuss the potential impact of the 65 kilometer stage on this year's Tour de France. We are, so to remind you from earlier in the show, on that stage, the yellow jersey will start at the front in the group of the top 20 GC riders, and there'll be four subsequent groups determined by their position on the general classification. So it's going to be really interesting. On top of that, um, uh, we do understand there will be no meaningful time gaps, by the way, between those groups. But on top of that, they have moved the start of the stage to outside Bagnier de Luchon and to the foot of the Col de Perisor. So there'll be no neutralised zone. It'll be just bang, go, like a cyclocross race. It could be the first time in pro road cycling history where the ability to clip in quickly could be a significant advantage. It certainly could. That just sounds incredibly painful. Mm. Another thing that it could change is team strategies in the run-up to the race. So if you imagine Movistar with their possibly four-pronged attack, Alejandro Valverde, Mikel Lander, Naira Quintana, Marc Soler, all in the top 10, they could feasibly have a huge advantage over Team Sky who maybe will only have Chris Froome there. Very true. Well, Team Sky are amongst a couple of teams who have, over recent years, experimented with giving their domestiques a day off almost. So giving them an easier day on a mountain day so that they're fresher the following day to do more work. And you wonder whether that strategy might now, well, come to a finish. I imagine possibly some of the sprinters must be bricking it because the mountain that stages are already dangerous for them. But on the shorter stages, not only will, you know, they potentially be at risk of kind of falling outside of the time cut, on this stage, they're gonna start already dropped. They will, won't they? They'd be right at the back. Normally the sprinters would try to give themselves some slipping room, wouldn't they, by starting near the front, but they won't be able to that day. Very interesting indeed. Uh, okay, moving on to other matters. Ben O'Connor, who was one of the sensations of the recent Giro d'Italia, has just signed a contract extension with Team Dimension Data. And you would imagine that his salary expectation must have skyrocketed after he was named as GCN's Rider of the Week on last week's racing news show. And, and you'd also think that we would get some sort of commission for that. But we were talking about 5% five, 5 before yeah, the show. Yeah, we'd be happy with 5%, Ben. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, other news, Jack Haig, who was of course incredible for Mitchelton Scott throughout the Giro d'Italia, will be their GC leader at the upcoming Tour de Suisse. Uh, he has been a GC leader for the team in the past, but you've got to say that the Tour de Suisse is a step up for him because, well, firstly, it's a huge race in terms of its ranking under the UCI, but also this year, there are a whole host of Tour de France favorites taking part. I think it's a deserved step up for Jack Haig. Mm. He had a fantastic Giro. He did. One rider who may be taking the start of the Tour de France, yet to be confirmed, is of course Team Sky's Egan Bernal. And he has been putting the hours in, in Colombia, training. Seven hours, 5,000 vertical meters, 193 kilometers. Wow. Traditionalist. Uh, probably not somebody who's looking forward to pro cycling when it gets much shorter stages, or at least he'll adapt his training. Uh, another rider who we are expecting to shortly confirm his participation at this year's Tour de France uh, is the runner-up at the Giro d'Italia, Tom Dumoulin. Now, we don't know as yet whether he'll be targeting just stage wins, just stage wins, or indeed the overall classification, but regardless, I'm very happy he's on the start line. I think that's great for the race. Yeah, it certainly is. Now, the Dirty Kansas 200-mile gravel race took place in Kansas over the weekend. And you might be wondering exactly how hard is it and what does it take to win it? Well, women's winner and world-class cyclocross rider Katie Kiyohachi had quite the story. She did. She posted a lengthy report on her Instagram after the event. Standout parts of that report for me and probably most people that read it were the fact that to win, she was sick in her mouth three times, or at least on her way to the win. That was not a requirement of winning. Uh, but also, she, um, well, she peed in her chamois so that she didn't lose contact with the front group that she was in through the first feed station of the day. Worked though, didn't it? Yes, she won. won. 
<laughs> uh, right then, what do you do, lastly, if you win the Hammer series? What do you do with your trophy? I think you hammer it into the ground, don't you? Well, you do if you quick step. Let's take a look at them doing exactly that. That didn't quite go as planned, did it? I don't know. I, well, I don't know what the plan was, but no, I don't think it did go to plan. It's time for a couple of giveaways, and we've got some very, very exciting ones this week. We have, indeed. We are going to start with the Tour de France Les Cadets Junior ride. Uh, Les Cadets Junior ride, basically. Uh, this is open to riders aged between 15 and 18, and wow. Let me tell you what an opportunity this is, because you will get to ride part of the final stage of the Tour de France, up and down the Champs Elysees, which is quite frankly, the best prize for a cycling fan of 15 to 18 years old, or any age, isn't it? I'd be amazed, I would have loved to have done that. Yeah, that would be absolutely incredible. So before you do enter, please, please read all the terms and conditions which will be on the giveaway page, which we'll link down in the description below, because uh, there are a few extra things just with it being a bike ride. But yeah, if you're entering, good luck. Yes, good luck indeed. Uh, and we know that unfortunately, many of you watching this will not be young enough to enter for that particular giveaway. Uh, so we've got two more for you, one of which is VIP. The other one, well, it's VVIP. Uh, so let's start with the latter. The VVIP prize is a trip down, including a private flight to stage 14 of the Tour de France. The VIP package is to the last stage, stage 21 of the Tour de France. And in both of those instances though, you will also get a ride in the official Tour de France car. How amazing is that? I'm actually considering handing my notes in at GCN so that I can enter this giveaway. Yeah, that is utterly, another utterly amazing prize. If you do want to enter, we will of course have all the full terms and conditions on the giveaway page that lets you know everything that you might need to know about this one because Again, mm. there's travel involved, so there are a few extra things. The link is down in the description. Yeah, good luck to all of you who enter. And if you entered last week's Topeak giveaway, you may well be wondering if you've won. We'll have the 10 very lucky winners from all around the world. Names on screen now. It's time now for another update on the GCN Cycling Club. Last week, we mentioned to you that we had appointed a brand new GCN Cycling Club community president, and as promised, this is the moment that we told them of their honour. Hey Boris, thanks for joining us. And thanks for some of your amazing Instagram posts as well. We've definitely really, really enjoyed those. So, what we'd like to do is, if it's okay with you, we would like to make you the GCN Club Community President for the first three months. <laughs> what an honour! <laughs> thanks, so what that's, what that's gonna mean is we'll send you a bunch more Founders socks. Okay. 001 socks. We'll get you set blue right ones. Yeah, we'll get you set up with a GCN Club President T-shirt. Wow. <laughs> a bunch of GCN Asos cycling kit as well. Okay. We want you to be really involved for the next quarter on helping us shape the direction of the club and just make it even better for more cyclists around the world. This sounds perfect to me. Are you happy to accept? <laughs> I'm very happy to accept. I'm uh, speechless. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, Boris was certainly very excited to get involved. And as club president, we kind of thought he needed to look the part. So we sent him a bit of kit. And here's a video that he put together and posted on Instagram of the unboxing of the GCN official president's kit supply. Swag. If only we were capable of producing videos that good. It'd be helpful for us, wouldn't it? Uh, we spotted Boris because he was producing some pretty cool content over on Instagram before that post that you just saw. Uh, but this role will not just be confined to Boris in the future, and uh, we will be appointing another GCN uh, Clark and Club community president at some point. So if that role is something that you might want to do, uh, make sure that as a member, you head over to our website uh, at the GCN Cycling Club and get involved. Yeah, definitely. We really love checking out your GCNCC photos, which you can hashtag using GCNCC. We do check them all out. Get involved, let us know your views too as well. What do you want from the club? Make sure you tell us that. More news very soon. Hack forward slash bodge of the week now. The hashtag to remind you is GCN hat. Use that on Twitter or Instagram or send the photo in as a message on Facebook and we shall see it there. Starting things off for us this week is Brooklyn Beard, who had a new bike day but didn't check all his bolt and so subsequently uh, had to use an inner tube to tie a saddle onto his seat post. By the looks of things. That's, I, would that work? I can't imagine it's particularly stable, so it's a definite bodge either way. Yeah, bodge. 
Okay, the fan club guy on Twitter. Is your cable housing too short? Just use two. It's a two metal for rules meeting quite early on in the cable there. <laughs> um, yeah. Bodge. Bodge. Bodge again. Certified bodge. We haven't had I a mean, hack yet. Well, no, no. I don't think we're going to have one here either. This is from uh, Jesse Van Hulst, delivering parcels on the bicycle in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. This one didn't fit in any of our cargo bikes, so I strapped it on my backpack. Yeah. You've got to be careful with low bridges. Well, that on your back, that's huge. Yeah, imagine if you like touch a bit too much front brake, you're so front heavy, you, you don't stand a chance, do you? Bodge. No, but that might hit the ground and prop you up so that you don't hit the ground. Just be stuck floating in the air. Well, the it, it's still, it's kind of a bodge, you know, it's just propped in the backpack there. Yeah. Surely this one's going to be a hack. Yes, it is. Oh, David Gordon, d go at Gordon Northo on Twitter, sent in the GCN hack when there's nowhere to rest your bike on your coffee stop. Now, Dan, we, we, we checked this out, didn't we? Because we've seen the bike bike lean. Yeah. But we think this might be a first. Well, we did top eight ways to lean your bike a couple of years ago. And we had, like you said, the bike bike lean. First time we've ever seen the bike 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 lean. If any of you out there can do the bike 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 lean, uh, try it out at home and let us know. Maybe try it on grass, just yeah. in case. David, you're an innovator, I think. I <laughs> bet somebody's going to send in the bike 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 lean. What this about time the bike, week? bike, bike, bike? Well, it can always get one step lean. further. Yeah. Just one step at a time, Lasty. Just don't damage your bikes, it's not worth it. Caption of the week and last week's photo was this one of Tom Dumoulin and a fan in a pig suit. Yes, uh, I'm going to give a special mention before we tell you who's won the GCN Camelback water bottle this week. Uh, this one did make me chuckle from Joel uh, Klingenberg. Roses are red, the rosa is pink, pigs are also pink, poems are hard, bacon. Uh, did have a little chuckle to that, but this week's winner is Ed Markey, who wrote in saying, the moment Tom Dumoulin realises he would he would swind up in second. They're both very good. It was very difficult to... Yeah, we had a lot of good ones on. last week. Um, in, in between all of the comments about Chris Room and the Giro Italia and what a tiger slam is, which we should get onto you later on. Sure. Uh, this week's photo comes from Alta Badia, where, as we mentioned, Emma Pooley is busy at points doing some filming for us over there. At other point, she's on the top of an enormous bike. I'll get you started. Uh, Emma, proving once and for all that descending on your top tube is very dangerous. Don't try this at home. It is, that's a, a solid caption. I very much look forward to kind of reading your much better efforts. So. Mm. Don't forget you can win a GCN Camelback water bottle. Yeah, get stuck into the comments and we'll choose our favorite this time next week. Before we let you know what's coming up on the channel over the next seven days, a quick look back at some of our favourite comments from the previous seven, starting from this one underneath last week's show. As we mentioned, uh, we didn't know what the Tiger Slam was. Hundreds of comments came in explaining exactly what the Tiger Slam is, uh, including this one from David Shields, which is probably the funniest. Hey guys, you know your love of cycling has gone too far when you don't know about anything else going on in the world unless it's cycling related. Yeah, apparently this relates to Tiger Woods holding all four of the Grand Slams in golf at the same time. Yeah, it's. I should really take the fall for that. It's probably my sheltered life. Also, I didn't realise that it was anything to do with golf. No, well, I had no idea. I, yeah. yeah, I only know about cycling. Underneath how to ride a loaded bike, which was one of size videos, Michael Burgess commented, so will Dad be doing the companion video, riding a bike loaded? <laughs> yeah. Coming to you soon on GCN Tech. Uh, underneath last week's live stream no, of last the Hamish, years, last stream. years, yeah, that's very important to point out. Uh, so last week, of course, we did the Hammer uh, Limburg live, and Jay Shockey chose the wrong video. Firstly, he said, "I thought Viviani was with Quickstep," uh, as he saw him in Team Sky colours. And then next up, this is awesome, and you guys make it better. Keep up the great work. Uh, yeah, that was underneath last year's Hammer Limburg, and so unfortunately, Jay, you watched the wrong one. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it though. <laughs> and then uh, underneath Blake's FTP test, uh, real cider reviews, which sounds like a channel worth checking yeah. out, commented, "I feel sorry for that bike when Blake was wrestling it. Does FTP equal fibre tearing point?" Yeah. Well, he's a beast. Well, he's a beast compared to Sai, isn't he? Or us. Yeah, yeah definitely man. compared to us, yeah. Right then, uh, coming up on the channel this week, on Wednesday, uh, we've got some bike packing nutritional tips coming up for you. Uh, on Thursday, we are going to show you how to turn your standard road bike into a gravel bike. And on Friday, uh, we're back, as ever, with Ask GC Anything. On Saturday, we've got a two video day for you. We've got Oat Cuisine with Emma. Oat cuisine, did you make that up? Oh, I'm afraid I didn't, but I'm very didn't proud think of so. having said it. And also we're gonna have Catherine's Pro Bike from the Dirty Hanza. 
Great. Uh, so Sunday, oh, sorry, Monday, we're on to the race news show. Tuesday, we're back in the set here for the GCN show. But a quick reminder that long, along with all of our normal content, great normal content, said that wrong. Uh, we'll also have daily highlights coming from the Criterium du Dauphiné uh, on our Facebook page. So make sure you stay tuned for them. Uh, we're getting them up as quickly as we can after each and every stage. And these are not actually only in English. So we've got the English version and we're also going to have a Spanish language version too. Yeah. So we shall link the latest one of those down in the, in the description and we'll also link you to the page. Yeah, and not just any Spanish speaker, legend of cycling, Juan Antonio Flecha, winner of Tour de France stages and Het Newsblad and a whole host of other big races. So yeah, if you're Spanish speaking or you just don't like the sound of our voices, head over to that one. <laughs> Almost end of the show, and you know what that means, at least this week, after a couple of weeks of absence, it is Extreme Corner, which this week comes from an Extreme Corner favourite, Brandon Semenuk. <laughs> Great use of lighting. Do you think there. we'd look cooler with red lights? No. Well, I don't think we would, but we can give it a go sometime last year, you never know. Uh, right, that is almost it for this week's show, but we have got a very quick update for you uh, from the GCN shop. We certainly do. So, expanding our range of fan kit, we've got our new black fan kit jersey. So it's made of the same great Italian fabric, it's breathable, at an affordable price point, and we'll link it down in the description below. Yeah, if you fancy owning one of these GCN tops, head over to that link and you'll be able to find it there on our shop. Uh, and that really is it for this week's show. Uh, if you haven't already done so, give us a thumbs up down below if you've enjoyed the GCN show this time around. And if you would like some more content, make sure you watch this video with Sai. Is FTP dead? You can find it just down here. <laughs>